We're going to go to Revelation chapter 13, and there's a lot that I have to read, and then we'll catch up. Okay. Revelation 13, the Antichrist is given as follows. At verse 2, And the beast which I saw, that's the Antichrist beast, was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. There are several parts right here that this beast nation is consisted of in the tribulation. The beast nation, he must consist of Western powers as well as communist powers. Those are two important things to remember. He must consist of communist powers as well as Western powers. That has been the two trends of nations throughout our world history. Now, Islam has been included now. So it's been communist and Muslim nations. So we're seeing a trend of this. And later on, as we hit forward to the 20th to the 21st century, we're going to include Islam later on. Islam's going to be included with the communist rogue nations. And they're going to be against United Nations or Western powers. So the Western powers are as follows at verse 2. The leopard and the lion. The lion, if you know my verse-by-verse -verse commentary in Revelation, I'm not going to explain it all here, but we do know that is referring to England as the lion, and it's referring to leopard as the United States of America. The bear is referring to Russia. It is referring to Russia. Notice wherever the feet of the beast moves, that's the bear. So wherever the feet of a bear, Russia, which is communist, wherever communism moves, the rest of the beast will have to follow. So United States of America, Western powers, they're all going to follow that trend. That's important to remember. They're going to follow wherever communism goes. If there is something you learned in our last discipleship class with the Vatican, Moscow, and uh, Washington Alliance, is that Catholicism is following the trend of where communism is going. But communism is too extreme, and Russia is competing with the United States of America. So they're getting into an in-between thing. Basically, the perfect branch, the perfect bridge, is left-wing socialism, or what we know as Democrats or liberals, however you want to call it. Now, I know that they all have their differing beliefs, but the point is, is that you're not on the extreme of Russia and you're not on the extreme of United States conservative, conservatives. Because remember, our founding fathers, all the way back then, that's as extreme as you can get for right wing. So you can't be extreme in left wing, you can't be extreme in right wing. So you've got to be in the middle somewhere. It's a left wing ideology. It's going to be a communist ideology mingled with Catholicism. That's the perfect bridge you're going to get. And that's where all the world is falling into. That's important to understand. So we're going to continue our history, and then I'm going to explain these pointers that's really showing that fact, which are showing these facts. Okay, first of all, Vietnam War. What happened? You remember Cardinal Spellman? You remember Diem, who took, uh, took over as the leader of South Vietnam. This is when the Vietnam War was undergoing against the communists. So supposedly the good guys are the ones that are siding with the United States against the communists. But as you've studied, uh, no nation is right with God that time. So it's just evil versus evil. Western powers are evil, communist powers are evil. The Vietnam War is one of those uh, great detriments that's a blight in our American history as a blight in our American history. Your pastor here don't support this war, and uh, I don't support anything that the United States of America does nowadays, pretty much. Uh, don't get me wrong, I believe that uh, if you are going to be a good citizen of your country, that you should support, do whatever you can. I'm not against that, all right? I'm not against that. So if there's a person or a Christian doing that, fine, have at it. But I don't believe that you should put your all into it you got to be careful of that. If there is a dependency on a system like that, then you are surely going to be disappointed and wasting your life. Yeah, right. Wasting your life. Because no matter how much good you do, the Antichrist is going to take everything over at the end. You must remember that. 
Uh, notice Trump's presidency. Yeah, we had some good things, and even some good things that never happened in our entire American history, but that did not change our nation. As a matter of fact, it made things worse. It made left-wing ideology even more extreme. So what's happening is this, the pendulum is swinging more to the extreme on right, and then the left is uh, swinging more extremely to the left as well. So it's not changing. It's yeah. causing a division even more, and pretty soon they're, they're going to need that bridge again. This 20th century was the perfect bridge that time. But something's going to break, and then you're going to need the Antichrist soon one day. But anyway, that's a whole other story. I'll discuss that when we get to the 21st century. Uh, as we continue on, the Vietnam War, Cardinal Spellman, uh, the CIA consisted of Catholics. Remember that? I showed you that. I showed you a secular article on that from the Catholic Herald. So uh, the majority of the directors were Catholics, and then some of them were Calvinists. So remember, that's the awful fruits of Catholic and Calvinism. CIA Catholic, Cardinal Spellman Catholic, JFK, Catholic President, DM, uh, South President, uh, South Vietnam leader, Catholic, all Catholics together with the Vatican citing them. But then what's going on is that, like I told you, is the Buddhists were suffering persecution under Diem because they were undergoing tremendous persecution from a Catholic di dictator. And I'm not talking about communist dictator. I'm talking about South Vietnam, all right, where the Western powers chose to side with. Diem was persecuting them that the Buddhists were burning themselves in protest. Now, that can be found in any secular his historical record. That one's uh, no, so I don't really have to prove to you that. That's been a common thing. That's why a lot of Americans were against the Vietnam War that time because there were just a lot of shady, crazy stuff going on. That is one of the most uh, big, uh, next to the war in Iraq, this is one of the most uh, biggest blights in our American history concerning wars, is the Vietnam War. We went there through 20 years, if you can believe that. Can you believe that? It's about 20 years we undergone that. That is just a horrible thing what the United States of America has undergone. Now, recall that America, they're getting, Americans are getting disgusted. JFK is getting under pressure. So JFK, he's leaning more toward the leftists. He's leaning more toward the leftists, and not only that, he's been uh, very uh, antagonistic toward the CIA now. Recall that before, JFK was supportive of the, the Dulles Brothers endeavor. Now remember, one of the Dulles Brothers uh, he is in charge of the CIA. He's a director of the CIA. Originally, JFK was supportive, but later on, we find out, and I don't have to show you proof of this. This has been common knowledge, and you can find it yourself. But J JFK, later on, he said, I am going to break the CIA in a thousand pieces. That's a famous statement that you can find anywhere that people can research. So notice that JFK is switching himself. And as a matter of fact, DM is reaching his end too because the embarrassment and the blight from the media is really getting onto them. Americans are protesting. So the Catholics, uh, the Vatican Washington Alliance is giving out pretty much their last stand to maintain their reputation. But it wasn't long to last. I'm going to read you some statements here from Vietnam, why did we go from Avro Manhattan, again he is my go-to guy for everything on Catholic conspiracies that I highly recommend, and also you might recall Dr. Rotman's church history book is based off of Avro Manhattan concerning about Catholic conspiracies, highly recommend. All right, now this is on chapter 20, the two Catholic presidents and a revolutionary pope. This is what the Vatican Washington Alliance did to try to keep the Vietnam War endeavors alive. On page 170, Madame Nuhu, so she has connections, family relations with DM, a South Vietnamese leader. Remember, they're all Catholic. This is very interesting. <clears throat> Came to America because trying to protect their reputation, trying to get the Americans to keep supporting the Vietnam War efforts. And her first call was upon the principal sponsor of the Diem re regime, Cardinal Spellman. Of course she's going to get Cardinal Spellman's help. He's the go-to Catholic guy in America that I told you before. 
<clears throat> the vast Catholic machinery went into action to make the campaign a success. Catholic papers, individuals, organizations, and all the vast tangible and intangible ramifications of Catholic pressure upon the mass media of the U.S. were set in motion, while the hidden Catholic promotional forces worked behind the scenes, influential Catholics came to the fore to sponsor, support, and promote Madame New's advocacy of the Diem regime. I right, remember Diem is the South Vietnamese leader. Claire Booth Luce, the converted Catholic who had been said when she was ambassador to Rome, was more Catholic even than the Pope himself, acted as press agent, campaign manager, and general sponsor of Madame New. The reception that President Diem's sister-in-law received demonstrated how Catholics in the U.S., far from condemning the religious persecutions, tacitly approved of or openly supported them. And remember, that's a, they're talking about the Catholic persecutions in South Vietnam against the Buddhists. On the other hand, the American Protestant and liberal segments told Madame Nuhu in no uncertain terms that the persecutions carried on by her husband and brother-in-law were abhorred by the American people. So the Christians knew that there was, that there was something fishy. So they weren't really supportive of that. Now, notice, uh, I have to say this as a side note, notice that the Catholics, how much support they have for the uh, right-wing areas. Now, if the conservatives are losing and they want to make a last stand, who are they going to make alliances with? It's Catholics, all right? And I'm going to show that later on in our history. But even right now, what you see, you see Catholic connections with ex uh, right-wing extremists. One of them who used to work for Breitbart, Breitbart News is a champion of conservative news today, but one of the people in Breitbart who became famous, who went on Alex Jones and did debates, I mean, he is the alphabet soup, if you know what I mean by that. That's how he uh, genders himself. And then the second thing, he believed in total Catholic dictatorship, just like what? The Vietnam War, TM. Just like go back to the Dark Ages, the Bloody Inquisition. See, just because you're in conservative parties and you want to support them, don't be surprised you might support a Catholic endeavor one day. Okay, so be careful of that. During, this is interesting. During a visit to Columbia University, for instance, Madame New was greeted by the students with hurrahs, obviously not, with catcalls and boos. At Fordham University, Catholic, right? We know that. Uh, that's, where, uh, that's where Trump graduated from, right? At Fordham University, however, she had an enthusiastic reception from 5,000 Catholic students at the Jesuit school. Page 172. How about that? See, this, there's a complete Catholic backing to the Vietnam War with Washington in their endeavors through Cardinal Spellman. There's no doubt about that. There's a lot of fishy things going on right there. Now... Will it last for long? No, it didn't last for long. Things went south. And what happened during uh, DM's end is as follows. He's got, he got betrayed by his masters. The masters, or basically the Western powers, or Western Catholic powers, more accurate to say, who supported him, in his endeavors to rule over South Vietnam to conquer and fight against the Catholic, uh, not Catholic, against the communist powers, they were about to put an end to him. Page 127. The whole issue at this juncture had become even more tragic because in the meantime, the U.S. had elected her first Catholic president, and even more so because on the personal level, Kennedy himself before reaching the White House, had been a consistent supporter of Catholic Diem. Indeed, he had been one of the most influential members of the Catholic lobby which had steered the U.S. towards the Vietnam War. As the domestic and military situation in South, inside South Vietnam went from bad to worse, now I'm on page 128, 
The manipulators of Southeast Asia made it clear to him with the full support of the military authorities on the spot that something drastic had to be done to prevent the total disintegration of the South Vietnamese army. The mounting te tension with Soviet Russia and Red China made a move from Washington imperative and urgent since further internal and military deterioration might provoke the whole of the anti-communist front to collapse from inside. The pressure became irresistible, and the first ominous steps were taken. Subsidies to the Vietnam Special Forces were suspended. Secret directives were given to various branches closely connected with the inner links between the U.S. and the DM regime. Finally, on October 4th, 1963, 1963, you see that? DM killed and JFK, JFK killed. All right, but anyway, all these things are, notice the shift and a change all of a sudden. All of a sudden with the Catholic backing. Now keep this in mind, all right? It's important to keep in mind. That way you don't really be dismissive of what some people might consider something suspicious going on or a plot going on behind it or instigators behind it. It'll make you more open to that. All right, so listen. On October 4, 1963, John Richardson, the head of the CIA in Vietnam, was abruptly dismissed and recalled to Washington. Certain individuals understood that they were given a free hand for a coup against Diem. A coup was in successfully engineered. President Diem and his brother, the hated head of the secret police, had to run for their lives. They were discovered by rebel troops hiding in a small Catholic church. Having been arrested, they were placed in a motor vehicle as state prisoners. Upon arrival at their destination, both Diem and his brother had been shot to death. Their bodies were laid at St. Joseph's Hospital, only a few hundred yards away from the Za Pagoda, the center of the Buddhist resistance to the Diem denominational persecution. 20 days after the assassination of Diem, the first Catholic president of South Vietnam, the first Catholic president of the U.S., John F. Kennedy, was himself assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Why and by whom has remained a secret ever since? After the collapse of President Diem's dictatorship, the U.S. involvement in the War of Vietnam was to last another 10 long years from 1963 to 1973. Finally, on April 1975, Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, fell. All right, now I'm reading page 128 to 129, uh, 130. To the communists, the following year on June 24, 1976, the first session of the Vietnamese National Assembly opened in Hanoi in the north. On July 2, 1976, North and South declared themselves reunited thus ending 20 years of separation. Their new flag, a five-pointed yellow star on a red background, became the symbol of the new nation, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. It had cost the Vietnamese people hundreds of thousands of wounded and dead, the devastation of their country and immense human misery. It had cost the U.S. billions and billions of dollars. Domestic and external bitterness, the participation of more than 5.5 million American men with the loss of more than 58,000 young American lives. It could be that the war in Vietnam was bound to come regardless of the intrigues of organized religion, yet it could be also that had not the Catholic Church interfered so actively in the affairs of that country, the war in Vietnam might, ne might never have happened. And I've already proven that uh, from so many quotations before, from so many quotations before of, of the Catholics, how much power was backing up the promotion of the Vietnam War. But notice all of a sudden, okay, so keep these things in mind, all right? Notice the sudden change, all right, of the Catholics, all right? Notice that all of them were Catholic connected, right? And suddenly there's a switch, a switch from promoting the Vietnam War to being anti-Vietnam War, a switch. And I'm talking about the Catholic switch. Because remember, those popes are the key. Remember I told you that? Yeah. Remember what happened after 
I think it was Pius XII, I think. He was, uh, remember, he was Hitler's pope. They were the right-wing extremists. They were the anti-communists. So Pope Pius XII was supporting anti-communist endeavors, including uh, Cardinal Spellman through the Vietnam War. But remember, after Pius XII, Vatican, Moscow, Washington were sending spies to each other. It's all elites against elites, fighting against each other. Revelation 17 shows it never changed. There are 10 kings who burn up the mother whore of Revelation Vatican. Elites fighting against elites. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. So there was a power shift in place. Stalin, remember, wanted his pope, his candidates. And remember, it turned out at the end, they, uh, the communists or the left-wingers got the pope that they want. So from extreme right wing, fascism, uh, Nazism, and then the anti-communist endeavors where they sided with the United States is switched now again to uh, holding hands with the Soviet Union or communists even though they weren't, really, uh, they weren't really friends or connected with them or promoters of it. But it didn't change the fact that they were trying to compromise and they did support them and they had some uh, friendly discussions with each other. That still don't change the fact. And I'm going to give you some interesting quotes here of the connections with the Catholic powers and the communists. Notice this sudden change all of a sudden where the Catholic Church was against the communists and then all of a sudden they now become best friends and now they're supporting the communists. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that Ho Chi Minh would get his support from the next pope? And remember, Ho Chi Minh is the communist dictator of North Vietnam. The switch. See the switch? All right. Page uh, 182, same book. His, success, his successor, Paul VI, who only a decade before had been exiled from the Vatican by the anti-communist Pius XII for his extreme left-wing views, went even further than John in appeasing communism. Soon after his election, in fact, while the U.S. was still heavily involved in her conflict in Vietnam, Paul VI made the first tentative offer to Moscow. This offer was labeled by the present author, the Vatican-Moscow Alliance, in a book by that name. But anyway, this is on, uh, let's see right here, page 180. Pope John the 23rd Ho Chi Minh agreement initially contained a subtle reciprocal ruse by both negotiators. It then turned into a double-edged sword threatening the future stability of Vietnam and all of Southeast Asia. And uh, we will jump to them a little later on as well. And then I'll give you some interesting stories about them. But Pope John Paul is going to get very interesting when we get to him. He bridges again. So it switches. So remember, now we're in the left wing side, right? And then something strange happens here, which I told you before. And then this guy comes in. So hopefully I'll cover all that tonight, all right? So let's do this. Page 175. While the doomed DM Kennedy plot unfolded like a classic Greek tragedy, now we have to switch, right? A no less fascinating calamity had been shaping up within the secretive walls of the Vatican. Pope John XXIII, in standard Vatican duplicity, had secretly contacted Ho Chi Minh. Okay, what just happened here? So remember, we're right here, right? John XXIII, he contacts Ho Chi Minh here. Had secretly contacted Ho Chi Minh, communist leader of North Vietnam. This step was taken without the least consultation with either the State Department Cardinal Spellman, or indeed anybody else in Rome or Washington. Page 176. Ho Chi Minh, although a Marxist, kept diverse Catholic advisors by his side, inclu including a Catholic bishop. He accepted the proposal in principle and countered with tempting offers of his own. Total religious freedom in the future United Vietnam, plus special treatment of the Catholic Church, including favorable educational facilities 
and frequent financial grants for buildings and the clergy. All this was carried out in the utmost secrecy, since at the same time the Vatican was loudly reiterating that the objective of the Vatican-U.S. joint operations in Vietnam was the reunification of the North with the South under Catholic Diem. The first result of such policies was seen at the Marian Congress held in Saigon in 1959, where the Pope consecrated the whole of Vietnam to the Virgin Mary. So not just South. He's including the North Communists. Although this seemed religious in nature, it had evident political implications. Many Catholics and non-Catholics took notice of this, including Cardinal Spellman and his supporters. Now remember, Spellman, he's supporting the Vietnam War, South Vietnam. So when he sees this, he's not going to be happy. Their frown became shock, however, when in December of 1960, Pope John created an Episcopal hierarchy, again, for the whole of Vietnam, including North. Not content with this, Pope John took an even more ominous step. He created an archdiocese of the Catholic Church in the capital of communist North Vietnam itself. Now look, Avram Manhattan is giving you specific details right here. So that's why I haven't seen any body really debunking Avro Manhattan stuff. This guy, he has connections with elites themselves. He was dubbed Knights of Malta, believe it or not. So, I mean, this guy, he knows his stuff, his material. They can't really deny or kick his stuff. He, uh, he gave a lot of interesting material here. Okay. Uh, ooh, I just lost my page here. Okay, here we go. Uh, Page 178, negotiating with the communists of the North, the Vatican reached a secret agreement with Ho Chi Minh concerning the freedom of movement of all the Catholics of North Vietnam. These North Vietnamese Catholics formed the majority of all Catholics in the whole of Vietnam. By this agreement, they were permitted, if they so desired, to emigrate to South Vietnam and to settle under the protection of President Diem and his Catholic administration. Now, this is very interesting. I'm not going to really read it, everything here, but on page one, 179, uh, I'll read it. Why not? I'll read it. Okay, page 179. Ho Chi Minh was too astute a politician not to see in the request, beside a ruse advantageous to the church. Also a deal with long-range political and military implications for the potential advancement of his own cause. He reasoned that a mass exodus from the north would greatly embarrass rather than help the Catholic regime of Diem by increasing the tension which already existed, the competition for jobs and privileged positions amidst the already harassed Diem administration would be greatly increased by those coming from the north. Kind of like what you're seeing right now, right? Is that clicking in your head about immigration? Thomas Jefferson warned about those Catholic immigrants from a long time ago, too. It's weakening the nation. That's why Ho Chi Minh took over, and he won. Even the Catholic Church, page 179, though willing to give out aid, was unable to cope with the problem which grew with each passing day. The economic situation continued to worsen. The prospect for the new arrivals of any kind of employment diminished. The lack of money became astute, and starvation made its appearance. The emigrants began to agitate and create minor commotions, which soon degenerated into riots, many of which were suppressed with the utmost severity. The slogan quote, the Virgin Mary had gone south, end of quote, which had encouraged the emigrants to follow her to the Catholic paradise of a Catholic administration had proved to be the siren's call to disaster, both for them and the stability of South Vietnam, just as Ho Chi Minh had envisaged. And you know what happened at the end? South Vietnam fell. Yeah. Now, continuing on on page 182, where I read before, the political results of the Vatican-Moscow alliance was spectacular and concrete. Remember, that's uh, Paul VI. So John XXIII held hands with Ho Chi Minh, communist. Now Paul VI, he's opening up to Moscow. All of a sudden, Eastern Europe, with its large Catholic population, was pacified in a very short time. 
in its struggle between the Catholic Church and their militant communist regimes. Priests, bishops, and cardinals, who until then had been systematically persecuted, arrested, and imprisoned, were released. Churches were open, and the clergy and the state began cooperating because of Paul VI opening up to Moscow. To the surprise of the U.S., who was waging war, her vigorous Cold War against Soviet Russia and her satellites, the two former mortal enemies, Vatican and communists, now began unprecedented cooperation. So notice that the Vatican-Washington alliance switched to the Vatican-Moscow alliance under John the 23rd and Paul the 6th. Switched gears again. What is the Catholic Church? A chameleon, as I've told you so many times. That's how it always survived in every dispensation and every decade. And as empires crumbled and fall, Rome continued through being a chameleon. Remember, pagan Rome, how did it survive? Through being a chameleon. Had to survive in being a chameleon. Okay, that's very interesting stuff. Now, I'm going to get back over here on J, uh, JFK, all right. Before we continue on, and this other parts, let's get down back over here. Who really killed JFK, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of writings, a lot of people who get into that. But there's one group we cannot dismiss and we cannot deny, all right? I do know 100%, hands down, there's a Catholic conspiracy behind that. There's no doubt about it when you look at all the historical incidents that happen all of a sudden that switched gears, that switched gears. Now this is a film that became famous by Oliver Stone, obviously. Yep. It's called JFK. It's a very, uh, it's a film that actually uh, won so many awards, eight Academy Awards and everything. So even though it received obviously criticisms because they don't want you to know who really killed him and stuff like that. If there are elites behind the scenes, if there's a cover up, there's criticism. But because this guy was such a uh, famous director and he did such hands down, uh, he won a lot of awards on that. But in that film, it's very interesting. The people who gets involved are as follows. The people who gets involved with, where they had to get rid of JFK, because remember, he gave a statement just earlier. I want to break the CIA to a thousand pieces, right? Clue one. Clue two, he died within a short time span of Catholic President Diem, both who are the first Catholic presidents ever in their nation. Three, CIA consists of a lot of who? Catholics. I've proven that before, all right, in our last discipleship class. I don't have to do that again. Catholic Church even admits that, all right? So then, all of a sudden, Catholic Church who are pro-Vietnam War, now they switch to anti-Vietnam War under this pope. What do you think they're doing? Cleaning up their mess then. And anybody who disagrees with them, they're going to have to clean up their mess. So that's pretty obvious. If uh, you don't need evidence, all you have to look at is is that the historical pointers, the pattern, and then it's pretty obvious. So let me just say that much. But here's the, for further, for further points that was supported is the film by Oliver Stone from JFK. So Garrison uh, is, the purser, is the district attorney who uh, in New Orleans, district attorney, who investigated the matter. So his name is Jim Garrison. And when he was uh, undergoing the investigation, he found that the highest levels of government are, are involved, which would implicate members of CIA, mafia, military industrial complex, Secret Service, FBI, and then Vice President Lyndon Johnson. They're either co-conspirators or they either have motives to cover up the truth of the assassination. Either or, all right? Now, if you study Catholics, you're going to find Catholics in all six parts of the, those groups. Isn't that weird, man? Mafia people, what do they make a big deal? What's their religion you find? Islam. <laughs> right? Isn't that weird stuff? So many weird stuff. So that's from the film JFK, and you can take a look at that. Here's another one. Another, another one is from, this guy was accused for uh, having connections to the JFK assassination 
and he was caught with the Watergate scandal. Now remember, that was the only thing where they can catch those elites. Why? Because you finally had liberal news media helping out. If the liberal news media helped this out, then we would catch every one of them. But no, it has to support a liberal agenda. Then they would do that. The liberal news media caught under Nixon's regime the Watergate scandal. And the Watergate scandal, they were able to hunt down CIA people, intelligent officers, uh, and then were able to uh, find them guilty and you know, prove their wrongdoing. One of them was E. Howard Hunt, tied to the Watergate scandal. But he gave a last statement before he died. In his last statement, he believed and he admitted the JFK assassination was connected to those guys that I mentioned to you before. This was, in fact, published by Rolling Stone. This was published by Rolling Stone by Eric Hedegaard, H-E-D-E-G-A-A-R-D, -E -A -A but I think it's been archived or edited now. The title of the article is The Last Confessions of E. Howard Hunt. He was the ultimate keeper of secrets lurking in the shadows of American history. He toppled banana republics, planned the Bay of Pigs invasion, and led the Watergate break-in. Now he would reveal what he always kept hidden, who killed JFK connected CIA to it, FBI to it, and then all the other people. Now, why is it that all those organizations would be involved? But it's a common connection which is very strange when we go to our history. The common connection is Catholic, which is very weird. The common connection they all have is Catholic, which is very, very weird. Why? Because Catholic tentacles go all over. Remember, the, don't forget your history. Now, let's go back to the past, all right? Let's blast to the past. Boop. When we start the elites, the secret elites group, when did they first come out? During the Protestant Reformation. The Jesuit order was planned and created. Why? Because to, long before CIA, long before FBI, to spy on the other people, to uh, blend in and pretend they're one of their own, and bring in information to the Catholic Church. And they had a Jesuit oath. They would die to become a Protestant, a Jew, or a Mason, or whatever, to, follow, uh, to spy, and then bring in information for the Catholic Church. Jesuits. Then the second time we hear mention of them was the Illuminati, when America was founded under Adam Weishaupt, trained by a Jesuit. Illuminati was, was disbanded. But Weishaupt made a promise. He claimed that my agents will go to other secret organizations and they will live on. So Freemason Lodges was consisted with Weishaupt's Illuminati. And Weishaupt even infiltrated Masonic groups. There is no doubt about it. That's why Illuminati is connected with Freemasons. So Weishaupt, his, uh, uh, his pattern was a Jesuit pattern. He even said that. So I've proven that to you before, all right? And then they were forgotten until Skull and Bones came to the scene. Skull and Bones came during the time of the Great Awakening revivals as well. And remember Skull and Bones? They had their connections to Weishaupt's Illuminati group back to Yale, which is very weird. And they had Catholic connections, which is very weird. Now, all of a sudden, they were forgotten, right? Or supposedly. Then all of a sudden you get the round table. Yeah. And the round table came to the scene and would you know the Jewish Rothschild bankers are connected with round table and they were back with Adam Weishaupt and Illuminati, don't forget. So you got Jewish bankers involved and then you also have the cap uh, people who follow the Catholic Jesuit pattern involved. The guy Cecil Rhodes who was involved with the round table mentioned that his position would be uh, Jesuit general. See, they keep following that. What is going on? Weishaupt's prediction proved to be true. His system would follow on for many years to come through secret organizations. The round table organization was the one that survived. Skull and Bones and the Illuminati, they had to go out in secret or had to be disbanded or just go away. Rhodes was attending a Masonic lodge himself, so there are Freemasons, Jewish bankers, all following 
a Catholic system involved. So jump ahead to the 20th century. What do you know, man? All of a sudden, now you see Catholics involved in secret organizations involved as well as Freemasons. That's what you see all over here. So Howard Hunt, CIA, uh, let's first go to him and then uh, what did he say? He actually said this. The, this video is called, uh, hopefully it'll still be up, it's on YouTube. A guy named Tommy Richards posted a segment of this video. It's titled, CIA Officer E. Howard Hunt says, the Jesuits formed the greatest intelligence agency in the world. He actually said this, quote, so this is Howard Hunt himself who claimed the assassination of JFK with all those organizations. Quote, we have always said, who's we? <laughs> Howard Hunt from CIA. We have always said, you know, in an admiring way that the Jesuits form the greatest intelligence agency in the world and always have. Founder of FBI is J. Edgar Hoover, for some of you who didn't know. He's connected with Freemasons. This is on freemasonry.bcy.ca, Grand Lodge of British Columbia and Yukon. They have a section on J. Edgar Hoover, and they gave him a 33rd degree Mason. They gave him 33rd degree Masonry. So he was tied to the Masons. All right, so now you see why FBI, CIA may be involved in similar means, because they have a history back then of Masons and Catholic, or Mason ele Masonic elements or Catholic elements holding hands together in secret affairs before too. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. History repeats itself. So you have to remember that. History repeats itself. Now, continue on with Freemasons, then what about NASA? There's a lot of them among NASA as well. This is from Scottish uh, Northern Masonic Jurisdiction, Jurisdiction Scottish Rite uh, Freemasonry website. The title of their article is Among the Stars, Freemason Astronauts. From Buzz Aldrin to John Glenn, many notable astronauts and American heroes also belong to the world's oldest fraternity. John Glenn Jr., 33rd degree. Buzz Aldrin, Freemason and astronaut. A young Colonel Leroy Gordo, uh, Gordon Cooper Jr. Don F., uh, I think his last name is Izel, I'm not sure. Freemason. Gus Grissom, Freemason. Uh, James uh, Benson Irwin, alongside Apollo 15 crewmates. So I'm not sure if they connect him to Masons. But notice how a lot of those people are Masons, actually. So they're connected to that. That's why there's uh, some weird conspiracies about did we really land on the moon then? Why would they hide that? Why would they fake it, etc.? Well, let's go back to our history. It all goes back to the, com to the uh, Washington and Moscow competition. Remember, if we go back to that history, it would explain why there are so many secret things going on behind the scenes. If that tension between Moscow and Washington was going on where the Vatican was involved, that secret plots were going on, think about it. When Washington and Moscow have that same tension for space, you don't think that there's going to be something, uh, something insidious or strange going on as well. Always, always uh, you want to give that option open. So let's continue on within that context of Moscow and Washington uh, going in the war with each other. So we go to the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? The, the, commun uh, the war, the Cold War continues. Let's go to Cuba and then the space race. Uh, you can find this uh, pretty much in any historical record. I'll just read from Wikipedia because it makes things simpler and because at least the mainstream would agree with this historical record. Uh, Wikipedia, this is, the title of the article is Key Events of the 20th uh, Century. Um, their section on the Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis illustrates just how close to the brink of nuclear war the world came during the Cold War. 
Cuba, under Fidel Castro's socialist government, had formed close ties with the Soviet Union. This was obviously disquieting to the United States, given Cuba's proximity. When Lockheed U-2 spy plane flight, uh, flights over the island revealed that Soviet missile launchers were being installed, U.S. President John F. Kennedy instituted a naval blockade and publicly confronted the Soviet Union. After a tense week, the Soviet Union backed down and ordered the launchers removed, not wanting to risk igniting a new world war. Now the space race. With Cold War tensions running high, the Soviet Union and United States took their rivalry to the stars. In 1957, here we go, let me go back here. Go from Vietnam War to the space race. The Soviet launch Sputnik, a space race between the two powers followed. The USSR reached several important milestones, such as the first craft on the moon, Luna 2, and the first humans in space, Yuri uh, Gagarin. The US pulled ahead eventually with its Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs which culminated in Apollo 11 astronauts landing on the moon on 20th July 1969. Five more landings with astronauts followed. Apollo 13 was forced to abort its mission. Nevertheless, despite its successes, the U.S. space program could not match many major achievements of the Soviet space program, such as rover-based space exploration, an image and video transfer from the surface of another planet until the early 21st century. In addition, both countries launched numerous probes into space, such as the Venera 7 and Voyager 2. In later decades, space became a somewhat friendlier place. Regular space flights with astronauts uh, were made possible with the American Space Shuttle, which was the first reusable spacecraft to be successfully used. All right, and etc. Okay, so. Uh, Russia and U.S. were competing with each other. Russia launched its first one. America soon followed. They're going to beat them. So then they claimed that they landed on the moon. Now, uh, did they or did they not? It's interesting that uh, uh, Bible believers earlier, they were questioning it. And they're, not, and they're like, did we really land on the moon? And Dr. Upman did the same thing too. But then... Uh, I could be wrong, but then the newer generation of Bible believers and Pastor Donovan himself also believe that we did land on the moon. Now, why is there a mingling right here? Did we land or did we not land? Because I believe this. Now, Alex Jones, uh, he's a, a lot of people turn to him for conspiracy theories. Even he himself on the Joe Rogan program, who denied the moon landing, believed that the moon is there and that we may have, may have landed on the moon because of how he sees everything. But then why are there fake video recordings, they would say, right? And a lot of weird stuff. Here's the thing. The thing is, what if we did really land on the moon and we saw stuff there that the governments don't want you to see? So then they'll show you fake recordings or fake stuff about uh, what the moon would look like. So Jones believed that, which, and I, that guy is pretty much a smart guy. I'm really heading toward what he says. That would make a lot of sense that bridges the two things. I think that it's possible that we landed on the moon, but they saw something that they didn't want others to see. Now, there are two clues to this. One is answers in Genesis uh, from Kevin, Ham, uh, Kevin Ham's website, did we really land on the moon? He pointed out, now there's a lot of creation scientists who are friends with these people who landed on the moon. Not the Masons, but the people who became saved Christians. So they were, uh, so they were uh, Charlie Duke and then the late Jim Irwin. Now the Masonic website mentioned his name, but they didn't mention specifically that he was a Mason. They mentioned Buzz Aldrin and I think Neil Armstrong, I'm not sure, maybe not him, but then John Glenn as the Masons. But they were, uh, there were lost people who were saved Christians, and when they were talking to this creationist scientist, they are saved brothers in Christ, they're not going to lie to them. So that's why these creationist scientists said that we don't want to accuse a fellow brother in Christ for lying. Now, it's easy for us to accuse them of lying or being masons who pretend to be Christians, but if you became their friend and you knew them for a long time, you would think differently. How would you know that? Because I myself, and even Alex Jones himself, and other people who dig into conspiracies, 
know what it's like to be accused as having a Masonic connection or a Catholic connection, or you're one of those uh, spies, elitist globalist spies, supporting the agenda. Why? Because you can connect that nowadays with everybody. So you don't want to go that far. So that's one you have to think about. Now, I'm not saying that uh, we have to believe uh, Jim Irwin and Charlie Duke, what they said, did we land on the moon or not, but I'm saying we shouldn't dismiss it either. Uh, I'm not dismissing about the fake moon landings as well. It's possible. But I'm keeping both sides' possibility. See, that's my, the importance. The possibility is open. But why I think that answers everything, which makes a big deal, is they did see something there. Whether they landed or not, they did see something there, and they don't want safe Christians to see it. Because with Noah's Ark, that's a long time ago, they found it, and then when the, the czars and then all those people died out, the communists burned records of those Russians who found Noah's Ark. See, they don't, the government don't want you to find out what supports the Bible. Now, here's a weird thing. Alex Jones went on the Tim Pool broadcast, and this is found in the channel Deep Space TV. And Alex Jones said he talked to Buzz Aldrin. And they went out together, and Buzz Aldrin was spilling the beans that when we went out there in outer space, either moon or Mars or both, we saw obelisks there and water there, and weird stuff there. There could be aliens. Now, I, I read from other reports, when you look at the moon uh, or Mars, some of those places, it looked like pyramids from an aerial view. Direct, precise dimensions, like Egypt. That is weird, man. If they got in contact with one of those sons of God, or they mentioned about Jesus Christ or something like that, or Satan, do you think they want the whole world to know about that? <laughs> if you're in charge of the government, you wouldn't want to because your government, your society, your nation will fall apart in half. Right. But notice how they're warming them up to aliens now, right? Yeah. To evolution. That way when it actually happens, they'll be more receptive and maybe worship them one day. Okay, but anyways, this is found on the video called... Um, uh, this is found on Deep Space TV. Just type down Tim Pool and Alex Jones claims about legendary Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin. Take a look at that. That was pretty wild, man. Pretty wild. But that would answer a lot of questions about what's been going on. What's been going on. Anyway, jump ahead in time. We jump ahead in time to the Pope's. All right, now we're going to cover some interesting information as we continue on from this pope to this pope. But remember, he suffered a mysterious death. I covered that last time. The reason why he suffered a mysterious death is because he was too communist, so to speak. Because it's communist, it's going like supporting the communists, supporting the communists, this guy supporting the communists, and then we got to get something that would balance it out. So you need a basically uh, a Catholic who would support left-wing ideology. That's the time we're living in now. We're in a Western uh, power nation that supports leftist ideology. It was this pope. He was the most. He was the best pope that time that did it and changed everything. And that's where we're stuck to today. But let me read you some interesting things about this pope. All right. So I'll read you how he, he was elected, how he became pope, and what was going on behind the scene. This is from the Vatican-Moscow-Washington Alliance by Avril Manhattan. He writes here on page 38, during World War II between 1939 and 1944, he, that's this pope, John Paul II, all right? He's a Polish person. He became identified with many activities during World War II, never accurately recorded except for the fact that at one time, as already mentioned, he did various jobs, had worked in a chemical factory, associated himself with Marxist guerrillas, and had women companions. Indeed, rumor had it that he had been a married man. His physical appearance, his personal background, his notorious predilect predilection for Marxism, his wooing of the crowds, in short, made of him the most suitable pope for the launching of the Euro 
Catholic American sponsored communism. See, it's that blending of left wing with Western powers. Beautiful combination. That's today, your nation, your stinking people today, your generations. With which the curious CIA coalition wanted to counterattack the Catholic pro communist stance of the Vatican Moscow Alliance. So, from Vatican Moscow Alliance, they want to go back to Vatican Washington. But this time with Vatican Washington, it's more leftist. Here we go on the next page here. On page 46. Pope John, so then Pope John Paul II becomes a new pope. He knelt, he knelt by the bedside weeping when told that Desker, he's a bishop, would not recover. He wept again. As the bishop, Desker, lay there unconscious, when afterwards Desker, having regained consciousness, was told that his friend, uh, Watch Tyler, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Watch Tyler, that's the John Paul II's uh, original name, all right, had been elected pope. You know what the bishop did? He became horrified. You know what he said? Quote, who will protect him from them? He said, and tried to get up from the bed. Quote, now I must recover. Then he added, trying to get up, yes, I must recover. John Paul II visited him again soon afterwards, dressed only in black. The bishop's health deteriorated, however, until finally he was sent to Switzerland. Shortly afterwards, he died, seemingly of a heart attack, but never accurately assessed, leaving heart specialists baffled. But remember, we have that history with this guy we covered before, and then the other popes, some weird stuff going on. Bishop Desker was only 54 years old. B what Bishop Desker meant by them was never explained. Whether he alluded to the elusive sponsors of Watch Tyler or to some other unknown elements connected with the future Vatican Washington strategy is difficult to say. The fact that Bishop Desker became suddenly ill only a few days before the papal election when Watch Tyler perhaps needed advice might have been a coincidence, yet the timing of his demise could justify legitimate suspicions. A primary dictum of any efficient intelligence directorate is that the liquidation of individuals who can become an intelligence embarrassment is not as rare as the authorities care to admit. Witnesses who know too much are better dead than alive. And we saw it with this pope. Look at the months. You saw this? You see this? That we covered last time? August to September. Why? They want a sudden change again. As times change, you have to make sure that you got the right powers in charge. That way you can get what you want. Really weird stuff, man. Really, really weird stuff going on. All right. Uh, I will, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I will end it here. Okay. So, the Catholic conspiracies, they're going hand in hand now with the communists, right? So, in United States, because it's United States of America, that's what we are. That's not going to change. They have to do it in a United States American communist way, if that made any sense to you, right? Which is today what you see. The other nations, though, they're becoming very communist. So the Catholics, they had their tentacles everywhere. They had it everywhere. In Vietnam, in the Eastern Europe area, in Russia, communist powers. But then, don't forget Latin America. That's been very ignored, I told you. That's where J, uh, not JFK, that's where Rockefeller was able to get his votes to support the Jewish elites, remember, for their nation that I told you before. Latin America, the Catholics, uh, that's where the Nazis escaped. And a lot of people don't think about these nations. You just get their votes, you can change United Nations vote, the assembly. So that's predominantly Catholic. They're not going to neglect Africa either. Soviet powers and Fidel Castro uh, made the visits toward Africa. And Latin America is, is, is overwhelmed with Catholic communists. So Catholics combining with communists. We're going to see that later on. And Fidel Castro, who's supposedly anti-Catholic, we're going to see what happened at the end, what he did with Catholicism. Catholic powers, they're a chameleon. They have their hands everywhere. You can be communist, 
You can be Republican. I don't care who you are. You can even be Christian. There's going to be a Catholic somewhere there. And I'm going to cover the Christians, the charismatic movement. Wow, yeah. wow. And then the National Council of Churches that Billy Graham falls under. That's why, don't forget those guys who stuck to their guns, the fundamentalists. But the denominations are falling apart. Who are the ones sticking out? Independent Baptists. We're going to come to them. Hence comes in John R. Rice, Jack Kyle's, and a sort of Lord, and Bob Jones Sr. with his university, uh, Lee Robertson, and all those guys that became famous. That's why Paul Chapel, West Coast Baptist College, Lancaster Baptist Church, Jack Trever, North Valley Baptist Church, uh, Golden State Baptist College, all that kind of stuff, they became, that's where they are today. They come from those IFB uh, giants, and we're going to cover them. All right? That's why the Lord had to use them. But they weren't really strong into Bible-believing truth. Then we'll come to, guess who? That's where we'll come to the scene. Our history is so fascinating where we ended up today. I'll talk all about that, Lord willing, next Wednesday. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching have been a blessing to the hearers. Help us not to forget anti-church history. It makes church history, our church history, even more alive. The importance of our own movement. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.